Welcome back to another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro, where we talk about how to get ready to live a more purposeful and empowered life. This week, I'd like to introduce you to Dylan LeMay. If, like me, you are a fan of Rich Roll's Roll On episodes with Adam Skolnick, you'll immediately recognize Dylan as the ice cream guy. Why is he dubbed the ice cream guy? Well, Dylan's been scooping ice cream for half his life. He started working at Coldstone Creamery and worked his way up to become a store manager. During quarantine, he started posting videos of himself scooping ice cream, decorating ice cream cakes while chatting about, you know, this or that. There were a lot of very unexpected things that happened today. First, I put on my apron and broke my glasses. And then as I was working, my lens kept continuing to fall out. So now I got to tape these bad boys up and walk around with taped up glasses for the rest of the week. I guess you can still say it was a good day, but... But rarely showing his face. His videos almost instantly went viral, accruing hundreds of millions of views each. I know what you're thinking. What's the big deal about ice cream? Well, that's just it. Ice cream by itself isn't really a big deal. But somehow, this 26-year-old has amassed a community that's over 15 million strong. I wanted to peel back a few layers to understand the secret behind Dylan's success. Welcome, DJ LeMay, to... <laughs> <laughs> it's only that on Instagram now. Wait, why was it ever two? Was there a DJ LeMay one? Yes, my oldest brother. Ah. Oh. David Joseph LeMay, and I'm Dylan James LeMay. I see, I see. But now you're Dylan LeMay on all of them except for Instagram. Yep, yeah. Well, I guess and Snapchat, but yeah, and no one Snapchat. really watches on that too much. Okay. Yeah. So you're on Snapchat, TikTok... YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the last I checked, I know you have over 11 million on TikTok and 4 million on YouTube. What are what is your social media reach altogether? Uh, I believe altogether is a little over 15 million, I believe if I'm adding correctly. So, on like a daily basis, you are reaching into 15 million people's brains. Yeah, that's the weirdest way to put it, but yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what are you doing with that influence, DJ LeMay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I make ice cream, which is strange that I got here just for making ice cream. Um, but then now I open my own ice cream shop. And so now I'm trying to reach into not just people's brains, but into their bellies, I guess, too, <laughs> um, into the real world. So it's been fun. Wow. Wow. Well, before we talk about the ice cream shop, the social media empire that you have created. I wanted to go back in time a little bit, even before you started working at Coldstone, which I understand you did at 15. Is that right? 15. Wow. Yeah. So that was over a decade ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's actually reach back even farther. You're from Michigan. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what, what, what part of Michigan? What? Taylor, Michigan. Taylor, so, Michigan. Down River. It's south of Detroit. Uh, yeah. Okay. And is that where you were born? Yep. Yeah. Well, I was born in Dearborn, Michigan, which is the city next door. But. Okay. And have you lived there your whole life? Yeah. All the way up until 17. I moved away to college and I went to live in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, so what was it like growing up? Like, can you describe for me like a typical Dylan LeMay day before you started working at Cold Stone? Yes, of course. It's fun to get asked this because no one ever really asked before that. So That's my job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was actually, my family was very close. I mean, my family is very close. We always have been. It's funny because all the questions I usually get asked these days are about ice cream. And so I'll give you a little ice cream <laughs> answer first that we can dive Absolutely. Through. For some odd reason, my parents would always let us, majority of the time we'd eat ice cream before bed, which is strange because you hear that's like something you're not supposed to do. But it was just like a family time. So we'd all get together. We'd get a bowl of ice cream. Mine was typically chocolate chip cookie dough. So I could pick out all the cookie dough pieces. And we would sit there and we'd just eat ice cream and watch TV or just talk and hang out. And it's just like, I feel like that's a cool picture of how to explain like my family is like, yeah, we were a family. We fought and we did all the things that you do. But whatever. At the end of the day, like we just kind of come together and just hang out and sometimes eat ice cream. So let's 
flesh that out a little bit. Like, who are the characters involved in this family of yours? (laughs) So I have my mom and my dad. So my dad's Tom LeMay and my mom's Kelly LeMay. They had four kids. Start off with David, who was named after my grandpa. DJ LeMay won. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And I'm giving their names for a reason. It's going to make sense in a second. And then my parents really liked the name Austin, but they figured it was kind of like overplayed for some reason at the time. And they liked Justin, but also they thought it was too common. So then they went with... Dustin. And so David, Dustin, and then they're like, you know, toys, you know, we got to keep it going. So then comes along me and my name's Dylan. And I was named after my mom, my mom's favorite character on her favorite show, which was 91210. Mm-hmm. And Dylan, I guess he was like, are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Are you serious? I had a poster of Dylan on my bedroom wall for like three years. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's who I was. So now I'm like imagining like you being in 90210. Yeah. Which is funny because I don't know anything about the show. So you could help me. But from what I've heard is his character is very opposite of my character. Yes, he is. He's like a motorcycle riding like bad boy. Yeah. I can't believe yeah. that's so fun. I need to now talk to your yeah. mom about this. So super, super funny. That's that's where I get my name from. And then comes along. My parents tried and tried. So they had three boys. They wanted a girl. Mm-hmm. And so when they finally had a baby girl, they didn't know what to name her, but they needed a D name. So they named her Destiny because it was their destiny to have a little girl. Absolutely. So, How perfect. Cute. Yeah. So that's my family. We're all D names besides my parents. But yeah. Oh, that's great. Now, do your grandparents live with you or nearby? Yes, they do. So uh, we live about just a few blocks away from my grandparents on my dad's side, and then maybe like double the amount of blocks away from my grandparents on my mom's side. But yes, very close within like a two to five minute drive. And were you hanging out with your grandparents pretty regularly? All the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, we pretty much every day, like we would go hang out at my, at least one of my grandparents' house, if not both of them, um, just about every day after, if we didn't have like sports or things like that. Yeah. Wow. So... It sounds like you had a pretty close-knit family, as well as your grandparents around all the time. I mean, very safe childhood, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's so interesting to me because when you're a kid and you're growing up, you don't really realize these things aren't like normal to other people mm-hmm. until you really start to become like a teenager, or at, least, at least like a young adult. And then you kind of like realize like how different each person's like childhood experience really was. I'm extremely thankful for just the family impact that I had throughout mine and like those bonds that are are just still there today. Yeah. So this ice cream tradition. Yeah. When did that start? It's weird because the further I get in it, the more history of my family I kind of figure out and hear about. And so on my mom's side, one of my great grandmothers actually has this like ancient ice cream recipe that she would sell out of her house which is so strange because it's like these things I grew up with and I didn't like put it all together I actually made a YouTube video with my grandma making the recipe this past summer let's make my family six generation old ice cream recipe look how old the recipe card is my grandma's grandma used to make this recipe and actually sell it out of her house but all growing up we just made it as a summer tradition and now that I'm older and know a lot more about ice cream I realized that this is actually a frozen custard recipe but we're still calling it ice cream we had to cook down all of our ingredients once they were brought to a boil then it was time to strain it out then we filled up our little ice cream machine and then added milk and vanilla flavoring this ice cream machine is probably over 40 years old but in theory it works the same way as the ice cream machines I used at work the central canister is full of all the ice cream and that gets cold on the outside and the blades scrape all the ice out and then whips it up so that it gets nice and fluffy once the ice cream is all thick you're going to take the blades out and then you're going to let it freeze up even more the way that we keep it cold is by adding ice and then salt on top of it once we pack that all down we're going to go ahead and put some towels on top so it stays nice and cold this should sit for a while but we got impatient so we cracked it open before it's fully frozen it tastes like years of good memories i'm so glad i get to share this with you guys and we did the math and we're like this is probably over 100 year old ice cream recipe that Amazing. my great, 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 I think great grandmother used to sell out of her house for, I think, a nickel a scoop or something like that. And we have the scoop that she used. We have the ice machine that she used for it, which is just so crazy because never did I imagine that becoming the ice cream man would really be like a family trend. <laughs> I just like somehow just keep it going somehow. I don't know. It's strange. Wow. So your great, 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 great grandmother develops an ice cream recipe and starts an ice cream shop basically out of her own home, which is incredible. And this past summer, you're able to recreate that recipe with your grandmother. Did you guys ever eat that ice cream during one of these evenings with your family while watching TV? 
Yes, of course. We we would eat it all the time. So this was like a special like summer tradition that we would do where my grandma would make this ice cream for us. And I can't remember what we call it now. Why am I drawing a blank? I don't know. But we, we would eat it like every summer. We'd look forward to when my grandma would finally make it. Uh-huh. And then she'd make it for all of us. And it was kind of like her freezer would just get stocked with all these cups. And she'd take like styrofoam cups and then fill them up and then cover them in tin foil and then put them inside of like the freezer and um every family would try to make it over and get as many as they can so we can all hoard them and eat them <laughs> um, but yeah so we do that just about every summer so it's definitely like there were specific nights where you'd be gathered around we'd be eating some of that ice cream so i have to ask because i think you'd mention you know we're like every other family sometimes we get into fights but sometimes you know we do this ice cream thing was there ever a situation where a fight kind of was squashed through ice cream. You're like, all right, there's some saltiness going on here, but we're all going to get together and eat some ice cream. I can think of a specific like fight, but I could definitely think of fights over ice cream. So I think we had, there were times, <laughs> well, I mean, with that, that the secret recipe ice cream of like the family recipe, there were definitely times where like, oh, there's an odd number left and we're going <laughs> to fight to figure out who's going to get them. So that, yeah, but I think there's probably been times where we did It wasn't like the ice cream probably didn't resolve it, but it was like the treat at the end of us resolving it. Because there's times that you siblings, you know, you just Mm. fight and then you realize like, what are we even fighting for? And you just kind of like hang out and you just kind of like laugh about like, wow, we really fought over that. That's so awesome. So you do this kind of traditional ice cream thing. What do your parents do, by the way? Yeah, my dad works for an insurance company and my mom likes to do all kinds of random jobs. So my mom kind of works in insurance too. She calls and helps people set up plans if they can't pay for their medical bills. So it's like the nice side of like collections. It's like they work with you rather than like attack you. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's sweet. It's funny to hear her on the phone. She's like so helpful. And it's, it's funny. It's very like mo- motherly. Mm. And then she also just likes to pick up random jobs. So she's worked at all these different random places like clothing stores or concessions at like arenas for different sporting events. She likes to find odd jobs. Were you close with your siblings then? Were you they your kind of daily playmates? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, growing up, we would all four of us pretty much would be home and my oldest brother would babysit us. If you can't see, I'm doing air quotes, babysit <laughs> us. Pretty much it was like we last time I was home just a few weeks ago for Thanksgiving, uh, I was talking to my dad and we were laughing about it because it was like the reason why they called it babysitting was just because it was socially acceptable to leave us home with my brother because he was finally at an age where you could do that, even though he definitely did not babysit us at all. We hung out a lot, a ton, but there's definitely different times with the age dynamics and the age ranges definitely caused conflicts. But yeah, they were definitely daily playmates. What was it like at school growing up? Mm. Yeah, I throughout elementary school, it was pretty simple. Just, you know, just went through it. I'm trying to think like, Really? What was elementary school? <laughs> it's so long ago. Um, well, let me ask you something specific. Yeah. I mean, at what point did you think that you would want to make ice cream a part of your work life? Yeah, definitely not in elementary school. In elementary school, I just wanted to be... I wanted to be a marine biologist. Obsessed. Why was that? Obsessed with the ocean. I just thought it was like the coolest thing. Like aquariums, I was like super into them. I was just, everything about it, I thought it was so fast. Had you seen an ocean at that point? Yeah, yeah. But like I'd never seen like a beautiful, like crystal clear, like water ocean. It was always like some murky like, <laughs> Daytona Beach, like <laughs> kind of cloudy, dirty water at the mm-hmm. time. Um, but for some reason, it just like fascinated me. Um, aquariums and just like fish in general and just like the whole ocean ecosystem was just mind-blowing to me. But then the ice cream stuff, it was just kind of an accident. I was in high school and one of my friends was a manager at a Cold Stone, but he was formerly a cake decorator. And he was like, hey, since I got this promotion, I need someone to fill in the spot. You're an artistic kid. Do you want to join? And so I guess that's kind of like if to answer your question, previous question, what was elementary school like? I was kind of like seen as like the art kid. Mm-hmm. Whenever it was something creative, I was like kind of put into that little category of like, oh, you're not athletic. You're like the art kid. You're going to try though because you're supposed to and everyone else is athletic. So you're going to like put yourself into that box. But um, so it kind of got me opportunities later on. But, you know, as a kid, it's like you try to fit in those like traditional little circles. Why did they put you in the art category? Where I mean, did you yeah. enjoy art? I mean, it sounds like you love science. Yeah. So I think originally the main thing that got me put into the like the art category is I had this light table and it was like this like Crayola light table, I believe. And so what you would do is you would take like a picture of something that you liked 
and then you'd put like a regular piece of paper over top of it. You'd turn on the light and it would shine the light through and you could trace it and then you could color them. And so as a kid, I would just practice drawing through that. And so I would draw people with pictures all the time, but they would look so much better than everyone else's because I was really tracing them. But it was really just like refining these skills. I also like was like the coloring book kid where like one of my cousins taught me how to color inside the lines. And then you like shade that and it always just looks so much better than everyone else's. And so I had like all these little tips and tricks I'd picked up that set me apart that made me considered like the art kid. Mm -hmm. Did you ever intentionally think to yourself, I want to pursue something in art maybe later? Yeah, no, definitely. Whenever my school, like the school system I was in, we didn't have a lot of like resources and things like that. And so there was no like art classes in elementary school. But then once middle school came around, there was an option for it. And so when I was in sixth grade, we had an art class. And so I took it in there. And it was like, interesting to kind of be put into this atmosphere of like, the art kids. But then sometimes like I was not good at stuff. And it was like, this is weird. This is my thing. Like, I'm supposed to be good at this. And it was like frustrating at times to like not be good at it. And then in middle school, we didn't have an option for art class. And then once I got to high school, art was an option again. But my teacher, she was just very like old school and like set in her ways. And so it wasn't really about having fun. It was really about like honing these traditional mm -hmm. skills. And so that was like difficult. And then when I got to my senior year, I finally got an art teacher and she was like, I feel so bad for your journey. Like, just have as much fun as you can. Like, let me know where you need help. But I really just want to give you open access to all of our materials. Just like have fun get to experience the things that you've always wanted to. Well, that sounds like a great teacher. But it was around that time then, actually even before then, that you started at Cold Stone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I was 15. Yeah. And were you able to exercise your artistic <laughs> talents at Cold Stone? Yes. So it was really actually fed like this hunger that I had had. Like as we walked through all those things of I had wanted to pursue some type of art thing, but I didn't know what it was. And I never had a good teacher to really help me like master a skill. And this was my first opportunity. And so it was like I had this foundation of like, there's something there. And I saw I had somebody that saw that in me and then really put the work into me. And so at the beginning, like I was 15. And my friend Dan that taught me was like, he was strict with me. Like he like, honestly, like I think back to it. I'm like, okay, that was a bit much. But he was young too. He was 19. And I was 15 when he was teaching me. But he would like look over my shoulder. And he's like, are you nervous? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you have to learn how to do this under pressure or you're not going to be able to like do it not under pressure. Like all these like crazy stuff. And I was like, look back on it. Like that was so like traumatizing, but I learned, <laughs> I learned so much through it all. And I'm like so thankful for it now, but I never imagined at 15 that I would do it for so long mm -hmm. or any of this. <laughs> what were your parents' reaction when they found out that you had decided to go work at Cold Stone? I think everyone was just kind of excited that they were going to get some like free ice cream out of me. <laughs> I mean, at the time for us, it was like, yeah, we ate a lot of ice cream, but it was usually just like store bought like like tug, tubs of ice cream. And if we went to Cold Stone, which is where I got the job, it was seen as like a special occasion place. So it was like a holiday or somebody's birthday. We would never go because it was expensive. So we would never go there unless it was for a special occasion. So now it was kind of like we hit the lotto. Like we get that good ice cream all the time. And so everyone was just kind of like excited that I was also getting to do something that I would enjoy so much. Well, I have to ask, I mean, you say that Cold Stone is the good stuff, but I mean, how does it rank compared to the great 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 grandmother's recipe yeah. so i think they're in two different like whole worlds one is like so much like history and like nostalgia and like all these things and the ice cream recipe that my grandma has technically i don't even think is like specifically ice cream by like fda categories because it has egg in it and so mm. i think it would kind of be considered frozen custard but i think they can pair in complete different ways like there are definitely days where i would be like yeah i'd take some like hardcore fatty 14% fat cold stone. And there'd be other days where I'm like, I just want the nostalgia of eating this, my family recipe. How much of nostalgia is wrapped up in any ice cream, even at yeah. cold stone? I think, I think probably a lot. I would say there's something so special about ice cream that I think all of us have experienced. And I think it starts at a very young age. And I think even with flavors, I mean, you'd be so surprised the amount of people that get gummy bears mixed into their ice cream at Cold Stone at all ages. And it's really just probably a huge thing of it is like a nostalgia thing of like you you can do whatever you want, but also like when you were a kid, you liked gummy bears and now you want gummy bears in your ice cream, even though they freeze and they're rock solid and I don't understand it, but you like it. So I guess get your thing. So for those of the people who are listening who are unfamiliar with Cold Stone, yeah. maybe describe for us kind of 
you know, how is it different than, you know, the regular Baskin Robbins when you walk in, you're like, hey, I want three scoops and a little bit of syrup on it. Yes. Okay. So they're not paying me to say this. I don't work for them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll still be nice to them because they had a huge part in my life. But um, yeah, no. So you walk in and there's all these different crazy cool flavors that are really good. And then you get to kind of choose which one and you get to choose your size, like it, love it, or gotta have it, <laughs> scoop it out. Awesome. And then they put on this giant cold stone. And then they put a little divot in the middle and they say, what would you like in it? And they show you all of these toppings. You get to choose what toppings you want in it. So it's just like the reason why it's so different and why it was so popular was because you finally have the freedom of choice of to put whatever you want in there. And so if you like cookie dough ice cream, but you don't like vanilla ice cream, you want it in chocolate. Well, then you can get your cookie dough chopped into some chocolate ice cream. So it's really just the freedom of flexibility. And it's also this idea that you're kind of almost kneading the ice cream. So for people who are into baking bread, you know, when you knead your dough, you're kind of pulling it apart and reshaping it and things like that. And there's a lot of that going on at Cold Stone as well. It's not just scoop and drop. There's some action there, right? Yeah, it's this like visible visual experience for sure. So... You were at Cold Stone starting at 15. How long did you end up working there? I worked there for nine and a half years. Oh my God, nearly a decade. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So what kept you there for so long? Yeah. It, honestly, it was just so much fun. It was so much fun. And I worked with a lot of great people throughout those 10 years, of course. I worked with a lot of people. It was, it was A big part of it was getting to do so many different things that were fun. So at the beginning, I learned how to decorate cakes, and that's all I did. When I was 15, I got to make my own schedule around the cakes. So it was just a lot of flexibility throughout high school. And then once I graduated and I went to college, it was the same thing. I got another job at another Cold Stone, and I worked there, and I just did cakes. And so it's it's just a ton of creativity. You get to kind of have a lot of customization. You get to be a part of so many fun experiences. Like whenever you think about getting a cake, it's for something special. And so somebody's birthday, you get to be a part of celebrating somebody's birthday or anniversary or wedding and all these fun things. That energy kind of carries over into the job and just makes it a ton of fun. But then also I began to learn how to do the other things there. And so whenever I kind of get bored, I just master another thing at the job. Just working with ice cream, is just a crazy experience. Like who, I have tons of friends in the ice cream world and it just doesn't compare because you just to be a part of so many joyful experiences with people. Mm. You said you worked at a Cold Stone while you were in school and college? Yeah. Where did you go to school? So I went to a small little Bible college in Missouri, and then that's where I worked at a Cold Stone there. Uh, okay. Yeah. And what did you study? I studied biblical counseling. Oh, wow. So what would what happen to the dream of marine biology? Yeah, somewhere that got buried. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know like the progression of that. I just maybe just didn't see like it being plausible. I don't know, but... Yeah, I died somewhere. So far, Dylan's story is pretty vanilla, but I soon discover that scooping ice cream, at least for Dylan, is so much more than handing people their sweet and happy endings. So while you were working at Cold Stone, you were there for a decade, yeah. and it sounds like you went to multiple different stores depending on where you were located, and you talk about kind of the role that ice cream plays in kind of nurturing that nostalgic feeling as well as kind of being there for people during their most joyous moments. Yeah. What are some of the things that you learned about people in general, human yeah. beings, by being behind that counter for nearly a decade and creating all of those cakes for people? Yeah, I think I, it's, it's so interesting to look back on because in the moments that you go through things, you don't realize how much they impact you until later on. And you really like hindsight is crazy. But I learned so much about people throughout conversing with people every day. And you build these muscles to talk to strangers and have these deep, quick conversations really fast. But one thing that I remember, like, if you somebody comes in, you're like, hey, how's your day going today? And they go, it's been horrible. Mm -hmm. You're not prepared for that. Like, what do you do in those circumstances? And so you have to kind of learn how how do I help somebody in this moment where I only have a few seconds with them or just like help them just live in their moment. So eventually I just kind of started saying like, hey, I can't fix all your problems, but I have some ice cream and I hope it just helps you feel a little bit better because that's what they're coming for. You know, you start to realize that, oh, that person that I talked to this one time, they're back again. And they're back again. And you start to like pick up patterns as well. Like surprisingly, a huge amount of our customers are actually like female. It's so random, but women eat a lot more ice cream than men. It's 
<laughs> at least in your experience, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. At least in my experience, you're right. Um, it's such so interesting, and then you start to like realize that there's like specific groups of people that just enjoy talking more. And I mean, I can't make any guesses to people's lives, but typically like middle-aged women, they'd want to talk way more. So there's like specific experiences that you start to like put these patterns together and realize that like maybe there's something missing there. I don't know. But so it'd be so much fun when I'm working that I would realize like, oh, these people that have a need, I guess it's to socialize and they're not getting like that somewhere. And so I get to be a part of that. And so once you start to kind of pick up these patterns, you really can like implement them into like not my work strategy, but just enjoying like, hey, this person really needs extra conversation today. So I'm going to really put that effort into them. And then it's so rewarding to you, not through just, oh, maybe they might tip you, but through, oh, wow, now I really brighten this person today. I really changed it. Now I see them tomorrow. And you continue that conversation. You really grow and nurture these relationships with people. And it just makes your job so much more rewarding than just, oh, I'm going to scoop this ice cream out and slap it down and put it in a cup and then buy. But it's like, oh, this person has a need I'm noticing their need based on this conversation and I'm going to plug things in to help them and it's helping me in the process. I mean, that sounds incredibly rewarding and also very interesting, but did it ever get exhausting kind of making yourself emotionally available in that way to so many hundreds of people walking through the door? Yeah, I'm like learning now, like (laughs) how bad it may have been for me at times. (laughs) like... I just kind of put like on autopilot. I think a lot of the time I just like learned and I would even tell like my employees this and I'm kind of realizing that it's kind of like bad to do this, but there's like a door frame between the back room at work at like at the cold zone that I worked at and then up to the front where you'd help customers. And I used to tell people like this was my motto and I expected it from them too, that when you walk through this door frame, like whatever you were taking to work that day, just leave it there and just go out there and create the experience for the customer. And we can deal with it when you walk back through the door. And so a lot of the time I would just put on like this face and that was a part of my job. And so, yeah, it was exhausting. But to me, it was like, this is what I signed up for. This is my job and I just deal with it. But when I walk back there, then me and my coworkers can handle our problems. But when I go out there, like, Somebody's coming here and I'm going to create the best experience for them. So you never really viewed yourself as merely just somebody making ice cream cakes or giving people their sweet desserts. You were trying to create an experience for them. Yeah. And it's strange when I think about it because I don't think I sat out like every morning when I went to work and I thought about it that way. But I think functionally, like, yes, that's that's what happened. It wasn't just about giving somebody something. I think something about me wouldn't allow me just to do that. You'd earlier described that one of the best things about your job was that you got to be there for people's most joyous moments. You got to reward them with the thing that they always kind of viewed as that sweet ending. But I imagine when doing ice cream cakes in particular, designing those, that sometimes the ice cream cakes were there to cheer people up for things that maybe not joyful and not fun. Can you remember any in particular that stick out to you as being, wow, this is a little bit harder for me? Yeah, it's it's been a little while since a lot of those happened. So I'm a little rusty, but <laughs> I will tell you a little bit of like a funny story mm-hmm. until I think of like one that fits. No pressure. <laughs> but I remember when I was in high school, there was one where we had to write like a paragraph on this cake. <laughs> we, we realized that it was this boyfriend that messed up somewhere. We don't know what he did, but he wrote like a huge paragraph about how he was sorry and that he loved his significant other and like all these things. And it was just so interesting because it was like this paragraph we had to write on the cake. And we we're like, I don't know what this man did, but he did something <laughs> so bad, I guess. Like it was crazy. There were things like that. There were some crazy moments too, like people like just wild stuff we had to write on cakes. But yeah, I think there's definitely been times. I mean, like even like people, you could tell where somebody was getting a new job and it was like a farewell cake where you could tell like it wasn't like a big exciting moment for them. It was kind of like sad that they were like losing their coworker and things like that. I know they're definitely like a juicy story, but it's just not coming to me at the moment. That's there's fine. So many, like, so many stories. <laughs> So did you feel at the end of a decade of working at Coldstone that you were a skilled professional cake decorator? Like you could open up your own shop and cake decoration? I mean, I think so. Like, I think for me, it wasn't really about being like a professional cake decorator or things like that. It was really just about, I mean, ice cream cakes is like a whole different ball game than like a regular cake. Uh, There's so many different like factors and like different materials that you use with an ice cream cake. I think a big part of me was 
not necessarily becoming a professional, but like I said, like that whole experience around it, it was creating these relationships with my customers to the point where even if my cake was subpar, they would enjoy it because like I made it. And I think it was like a big part of it to me was really practicing that experience around it rather than just what the product might be. At this point, I wanted to dig into where this instinct to help people came from. Why was it that Dylan couldn't, as he described, simply scoop ice cream? It turns out that Dylan assumed the role of counselor quite young, and you won't believe some of the problems he was entrusted with solving while he was barely a teenager. Where do you think you developed that sort of drive to help people? Because that's clearly kind of what's motivating you, not just at Coldstone, but even what you studied in college. Yeah. Was that something that you always felt even growing up? I want to help my brother. I want to help my sister. I want to help my parents. Yeah, I'm not sure like the exact source of it, but it's something I've been thinking about for a, a while now. But there was something in me as a kid where I would, the earliest like thoughts I can remember of things similar to this is when I was a kid, I just remember being around a lot of adults say at like ice rinks between my siblings playing sports and things like that. And I would just sit around and listen a lot. Like I would just love to listen, but I'd love to talk too. And I'd Mm -hmm. kind of balance the two, I think decently well. Whereas if if adult approached me and wanted me to tell them a story, I'd tell it in great detail and I'd show so much emotion. And they always said that I was so expressive with my face, I guess. And they would always think it was cute. And so I, I think that kind of worked that muscle of like, I would listen to what all the adults were talking about and I would just absorb everything from them. And then I would love to tell my own stories and share them in very like expressive ways, I guess. But then throughout time, I think that that loop of listening and talking, listening and talking, people eventually began to approach me about their things. And I would use these problems, problem solving skills. I think I just grew through trial and error. And then by the time I'm reaching high school, people are coming to me with like big issues Mm -hmm. and expecting something from me of wisdom which I didn't understand where it was coming from but I think it was I had slowly built this thing over time where people felt comfortable with me to share things and I'd want to help them. So you were a counselor of sorts to your friends and your peers even as early as high school? Yeah it's crazy I mean I think I've kind of told you parts of this before but I mean my brother had a kid while we were in high school so my brother was 16 she was 15 and I was 14 when they got pregnant and I helped them throughout that whole process and people had seen me go through that those circumstances with them and how helpful I was to them to the point where like other friends would come up to me and be like, hey, I'm also a teenager. I'm also impregnant. Like these are the options I'm considering. Can you help me think through things? Like that's a big, big ask from someone. And especially us being such kids. Like, yes. Who am I? <laughs> like I'm 14. <laughs> like I'm a little boy with like long flippy hair and like big baby cheeks. Like I don't know what's going on. And for some reason, like these are situations that we had to like think through and go through and to the point where like somebody felt more trust in me than an adult and like, who am I to even help you think through these things? But just crazy circumstances like that would come about. And just because of some reason, I created this atmosphere of people where they felt comfortable to talk about things. Where did you derive the confidence to give that sort of advice, though? I don't I think just listening to people, I think a lot of it was really just hearing people for years kind of walk through circumstances with other people. It may have been like through like church or just adults I had been around and like all these different things. I think it kind of just grew those muscles of like, how do you care for people and how do you help them think through and walk through circumstances? Do you think that there is a specific theme that maybe connects the kind of advice that you give, whether it's always bending towards compassion or... Was it more of, like you said, a problem-solving theme where you're trying to find a solution for them? Yeah, I think if I think back, I think a lot of it is trying to help people think through like how they'd want to be treated in circumstances, really. So I think a lot of it is um, like empathy and putting yourself in other people's like, shoes. I think a lot of things I would pull for were that because I think like, perspective in that way, I think, lends a lot. But I think also helping people even do that to themselves. So like depending on the circumstance of like, hey, have you, can you think back? Have you ever been in a similar circumstance? Like how did that play out for you? Like what did you do? And then kind of help them learn from maybe that thing in the past. And I kind of like implement those tools to the future. I think I kind of leaned on a lot of things like that, but it's always circumstantial. It doesn't, I don't know. And I also was not clinically trained. I was just like a kid. (laughs) I didn't know what I was doing. And so really just try to be there and just do the best that I can and just try to be a good friend. Mm. 
I think at that age, you were 14 years old, yeah. your older brother is going through what I think most people would describe as a bit of a crisis, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's happening inside of your family. It's happening to someone you love. Yeah. And not only are you a bystander of something happening to your family that's a pretty big deal, you're also being asked to lend advice and counsel on something at a very young age, which is extremely, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I guess, who did you lean on? And people are leaning on you for advice at the age of yeah. 14. Who did you go to when you had a problem, when you had a crisis? And presumably, even going through this and watching your brother struggle through this, that must have taken its toll on you as well. Where did you go? Yeah, I think that was one of the hardest parts about like being a young adult is that I never knew where to really find that. There were like many circumstances that I would struggle with throughout high school and things like that. And I'd open up to friends and they really wouldn't know what to say because they weren't used to it. Because like in my friend groups, it was like I was that person. And like it was like funny too because we would have different times where they would like almost like safeguard my innocence and things like that because they wanted to keep me like pure for them because I was like their personal priest or something. I don't know. But so then when I would open up and I would have like something that I needed to share, talk through, like no one knew how to help me because I think I almost took on that whole weight in the circles that I was in. And so I think it was really difficult. There were times where I felt like I didn't have that type of friend. I didn't have that person that I could really like come to. And so I kind of had to just do it for myself. I had to like figure it out which was really difficult at a young age like that. Mm. Did that process of doing it for yourself, being that person for yourself, did that inform how you were there for not just your friends and your peers, but even for some of the customers who were rolling into Cold Stone, maybe having a bad day? Oh, I think 100%. Yeah. I think it definitely like poured into all of that. Because I think I had to like learn and grow a lot when I felt like I didn't have that like specific person. So then I felt like I had kind of learned a lot about myself in that process where I'd want to be there for other people. I want to help them if I could and just be at least be an ear if they needed that. With this foundation, we shift gears to how Dylan built his ice cream empire, starting on TikTok and then expanding to YouTube and even New York City. Though the landscape has changed, not surprisingly, Dylan continues to hide himself, quite literally, to make room for everyone else. So let's fast forward about eight years February 2020. Yeah. We're in the middle of a pandemic. What was Cold Stone doing during the pandemic? It was actually so funny. And this is almost a direct quote, but <laughs> one of the people I was working for, I was like, they're closing down like non essential businesses. And one of the owners I worked for, she said, if McDonald's can serve French fries and call that essential, we can serve ice cream and call ourselves essential. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, this is a hard time. People need ice cream to get them through it. We're staying open. That sounds logical to me. <laughs> sounds great. Let's do it. Um, and so it was this very strange shift because at the t that time, that's when everyone in the U.S. was like, whoa, this is like actually serious. Like we have to take this serious. And so all the college campuses like one by one are like shutting down and sending everyone home. And so... I had this early shift where I was a manager at the time and I was managing this cold zone and all of my employees were college students. And so they're all getting sent home and I'm like, okay, I'm panicking. Cause I'm like, what do I do? I don't have any employees now. They're all leaving. Well then the opposite happened too, where all of my employees that work in the summer that live there, they're all getting sent home. And so now they're all coming back and asking if they work for me. And so that time it was kind of this weird transition, but it was getting, we were like slow cause the lockdowns were beginning and no one was leaving their house. But everyone was really scared. And so no one wanted to come out. And so we really were just like dead. And so we were all just like bored at work. We would still show up and do our thing. It was really interesting. But then that led to what comes next. And what came next? <laughs> so one of my friends, Allie, comes home from college. And she's like, hey, my goal for this summer is to become TikTok famous. And I was like, what the heck is TikTok? And recently I was on Instagram. And there's an artist that I follow on Instagram. And she was like a middle-aged lady really respected her, followed her for a long time. And she was like, hey, if you're an artist, you need to get on this app called TikTok. I was like, why do I keep hearing about this app? It's just teenage girls dancing. This makes no sense to me. And so I was like, whatever, I'm going to download it. I'm going to try to understand what's going on. And I found out it wasn't just teenage girls dancing. There was something else going on. There, were, there was these weird pockets of all these different types of people sharing the things that they care about. And so I started binging it. 
And as we all did, a lot of questionable things in 2020. Uh, there's a day, there's many days where I watched over 10 hours of TikTok. <laughs> One day it was 14. That's like my record I remember and I hope that's it. But 14 <laughs> hours in one day of screen time on the app. And really in those moments when I was watching it for hours and hours, what I was doing is obviously caught up in consuming it, but really just trying to understand what in the world is this app and why are these videos going viral? Why are millions of people watching this seemingly like dumb clip in my eyes? And then eventually it was like, okay, well then let's do this. So my friend Ali wanted to be famous, TikTok famous. And so we all, all of my employees and my friends, we were all trying to figure out like what that means and how to do it. And so we just kept practicing and trying and learning and eventually I started to figure it out. And so I'm my one of my good friends, she was about to have a baby and she's like, Hey, I need a gender reveal cake. I was like, Wow, this is my perfect opportunity to make my first real TikTok. And so I made it all about this gender reveal cake. And then that video received three hundred thousand views, I think, in the first few days. I was like, Okay, I think I get this now. And so I just kept kind of plugging away at it and different opportunities would come up where I was like, This is a great story. And eventually I started getting like a couple million views on some videos. And then there's this one day where it was about to start my shift. And I was like, I'm going to make this video. I think it'll be fun. But I, I think it's a dumb idea. But we'll just see how it goes. So I, I document my your first day at Cold Stone. So I imagine you as the audience are starting your first day and I'm training you as a manager, like from my perspective. But I'm filming the video as if you're doing it with your hands. Because at the time, to scoop ice cream, I needed two hands to do it. So I was like, how do I film? So I, I strapped my camera around my neck, and then I began to film this video. And I talked to you as if it's your first day. I post that video before my shift. And then when I checked it halfway through my shift, it had like 3 million views. And I'm freaking out because I'm like, this was a dumb idea. Why does this have 3 million views? By the end of my shift, I think it had 5. By the end of the night, it had 7. The next day, I think it had 9. And the next day I began seeing all the comments were from Australia. And I was like, this is insane. Like this is reaching people all over the world. Like what the heck? This is me just doing my job that I've done for almost 10 years. You know, it's crazy. Wow. So there's so much to unpack there. Like we could spend five hours just talking yes. about those first two videos <laughs> that you were right. talking about. But I want to go back to that first one that you did, the gender reveal. And you said something really interesting. You said, I figured it out. Yeah. What was it that you had figured out that made you zero in on this gender reveal cake as here's my opportunity? Because I got to tell you, there are a lot of people out there, many, many who are famous podcasters, famous chefs, famous authors, famous thought leaders who are trying to crack the code of TikTok. Yeah. So what is it that you saw after your 14-hour binge that allowed you to kind of collate that information and say, a gender reveal cake is going to get me TikTok famous. Yeah. So there's a few things that stick out in my, my memory. But one of them was there was this girl and she was like renovating a shed. And I was like, this is so random. But she was doing it with her and her friends and she was documenting the process. And it was doing really well at the time. And it was at the beginning of TikTok where there was only a couple people on the platform. So like everyone knew who everyone was that was doing well. And then I saw this other guy and he was like making smoothies. And I was like, this is so random. And it was like his day in the life. But what I realized what was doing well for them is that they were doing a voiceover and they were also like giving a full product. So they would have a storyline and then they would show you something. And so like in the girl's video, she's renovating the shed, but she would tell you what the project of that day was. So it was like the whole shed got done in one video. It was like, hey, today we're going to clean out the rafters in my shed. And so she would like talk through what she did and she would show how she was doing it and all these things. She'd find like a dead rat and like all these weird things. And so for me, when I when I got the opportunity to do the, the gender reveal cake, I was like, oh, this is like a complete story. I can make a full product in this video. And it has like a fun storyline if like oh like let's figure out together like what the gender of this baby is going to be and so as i'm making the cake i'm like alluding to like oh there's going to be like a surprise ending which is we're all going to figure this out together and so i that that secret thing is really just you need a good storyline and then you need to have a payoff at the end so with that girl she's cleaning out the shed so you get to see that the, whatever she's working on you get to see that final product of like oh the shed is clean or like the guy showing you his day he was explaining it all and then at the end you saw like what his day ended up being um and so really for me that's what i was trying to do and that's so interesting because you had earlier said that part of what you were learning to do 
I think even in high school, Mm -hmm. was learning to tell your story while listening then to all of the stories that are being told to you. How much of listening has played a role, at least in your mind, in being an effective storyteller? Oh, I, I think probably so much. I mean, when you're a kid, you don't really like, realize like that's how it's working and that's how it's how, that's how you do it. But I mean, I think a lot of the part of being a good storyteller is listening because I tell every aspiring creator the most powerful thing that you can implement in your strategy of being a good content creator is reading your comments because that's the direct feedback of what's working. So say for example that first video that really really blew up that i was talking about when i did your first day at coldstone is i read through every single one of those comments i went through and i liked every single one and i read it because for me i was just mind blown but also i realized that oh this video is doing well but why is it doing well these people are going to tell me in the comments and so as i'm reading through them i'm seeing oh wow how is he filming so now i know oh i need to film like this every time now and other people are like wow this is like vr and i'm like oh cool so this is what they're thinking of so then that gives me more ideas like oh i can film more things so it looks like vr or like oh wow in australia we have cold rock and so now i'm like oh i can research this other thing and maybe talk about how australia has a different chain that's similar so you really just get tons of ideas but really it's learning but now i know oh i can tell a story about this because this is what people are interested in Whereas if I didn't read those comments and I wasn't listening to people, then I would just have to guess next time. And that story might not resonate with people. People might not care. And so I think it's just really informative to listen. And then you learn what people enjoy, what people like, and then you know what to tell stories, good stories about. If you've listened to this point, then you're probably starting to understand the extraordinary nature of what Dylan has built. But in case there's any doubt, we discuss the power of community and in particular, how Dylan leverages his reach to celebrate that community. I've always believed that looking at the comments and reading at the comments was a way of understanding this community that you're building around your content, around your storytelling. But it sounds to me that there's this other dimension to that community. Of course, the comments, that's where the community is. That's where it thrives, right? But now it's also something that provides you with not just feedback, it sounds like, like it's almost like it's not an echo. It's not merely like a resonance. It's like a direct connection Mm -hmm. to these people who have in many cases sort of visceral reaction to the type of content that you're creating. I guess what role does community and community development have in the type of work that you do as, you know, Dylan LeMay on TikTok and on YouTube, especially since you seem to kind of thrive on collecting the data, you know, whether it's, you know, watching a full day (laughs) of TikTok videos or getting into the weeds with your comments, you know, this is in some ways a very technical data collection exercise, but obviously there's a an emotional nostalgic component to the storytelling that you're doing. Maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, where does community fit into that overall strategy of building a much wider story? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I think was so helpful at the beginning for sure is that um, like we said before about decorating the cakes is that this is an experience that I get to share with them, but now I get to share this with millions. And I think that's one of the reasons why Ice Cream Cakes was one of the, it was the number eight food trend on TikTok in 2020 because we made so many ice cream cakes together, me and my audience. And so I got to be a part of so many bigger things because people began to order cakes that they couldn't even eat because they just wanted to share it with millions of people. And so there was so many crazy events, like somebody got, wanted me to celebrate their two years of sobriety with them. Um, like that's such a crazy thing that I never it's would have imagined I'd celebrate. But not only do I get to do that with them, I get to share that with now with millions of people and then congratulate them on their two years. And then you look through the comments and see how much that impacted people that are also struggling with that same journey. And really everyone working together to push each other forward of like, hey, it's been two months for me. That's so encouraging. They made it two years. Like I can't wait to go. And then somebody replying to their comment. And so it's like things like that of people really coming together and you see the bigger picture of like, whoa, this is way bigger than I ever imagined. And I'm just decorating an ice cream cake. Like what in the world is this? I want to I want to pick up on that, this idea that you're getting to share this moment with people and all you're doing is decorating an ice cream cake yeah. and you're creating this bigger picture, you say, right? Yeah. 
Well, one of the most amazing things about the overwhelming majority of your videos is that we don't get to see your face. Yeah. There is sort of an invisible guy who's doing all of this. Why did you make that decision? I'm assuming at some point to say, I'm going to keep it like this, whether it's, I want them to continue having this VR experience or, you know, this point of view experience, or was it something even more intentional than that? I don't want my face to distract people. I want this to be about them. Yeah. I think, I think there's many things. I think pretty much majority of the stuff that you just asked is, is true to it to some extent. I think that at the beginning, the simplest form of the answer would be, I have this ice cream I need a scoop and I have two hands. How do I do it? Okay. So filming from my point of view is the easiest way to do that. But then also as you look at these apps and like what I thought it was to begin with, which was just a bunch of random teenage girls and boys dancing, usually like pretty provocatively, I really wanted to stand out different from that. And so I think a good way to do that is to make something else the focal point and not people. Because I don't, I don't think people get so caught up in looks and things like that, especially with kids. I really wanted them to focus on something else. And I wanted to kind of be like a pure light in the in this crazy TikTok world that was corrupting so many people's brains, as they're saying. So I really wanted the focus to not be me, but be the ice cream and be the stories and be the people and the things that are getting passed along and not be me. And I think that was an easy way to do it. I think there's so many layers to it all, but I don't think it was very strategic. I think it just kind of happened. And it's because it happened that it was me. Like that's, that's who I was. I, I wanted to be the person behind the camera, not in front of it. Mm. Does it at all sort of remind you of kind of the role that you played in high school where you were the one where everyone was coming to you and leaning on you and you didn't necessarily have anyone else to lean on. And now again, you're the guy behind the screen. You don't show your face. You're not the main character. Yeah. You're making everyone else the main character. Yeah, I'm learning more and more every day that yes, that is exactly what happened. It is so interesting at the time too, because when I think back, I realized like how all of these little things, and I think it's really nice that you started off at like such a young age, because I, I really see how each little building block piece has built me into like what this is. And so when I talk about people and say like, oh yeah, I hit in 56 days, I hit a million followers on TikTok. They're like, wow, you blew up overnight. And I realized like, no, this was like a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. There's been so many little building blocks and pieces that have got me to like this point. And no, like you said, yeah, there were definitely times all throughout that, that, that added up to make me who I am. Yeah. Well, one of the other, you know, pretty remarkable things about the videos that you post on TikTok and on YouTube is your ability to create a beginning, middle, and an end. Like you said, that yeah. payoff is really important. Yeah. You create the story and sometimes a very short video. I mean, I take 60 seconds. I, I take every second that I can get. Um, you know, I know that TikTok and on Instagram, you can now do 90 and you know, on TikTok, you can do three minutes or even up to 10 minutes. But, you know, I still try to stick to about 59.2 seconds, yeah. right? Yeah. How do you manage to wedge so much into such a small period of time? Yeah, I mean, I think I think somewhere along the way, I think I've kind of gotten away from like the soul of it. I think at one point I was doing that ex same exact thing. I was taking up the full minute that we were allowed to have and really packing it full of a story. But eventually along the way, I think I kind of like saw the algorithm changing at different times and what was getting prioritized was shorter. And so I think a lot of it kind of changed from like the soul of the message to kind of being what's catering to that. And so I think now I kind of try to balance doing both at times. But really, I think a big part of it is whatever the story you're trying to convey is. So sometimes that story might be like something about someone's life or whatever this journey is or whatever the cake theme is. But other times it might just be, oh, I have red, <laughs> I'm making a red slushy and I'm just explaining how I'm making this red slushy and that's only a 17 second story. And so I don't need to make it any longer than it needs to be. Well, I think one of the most beautiful things about the community that you've created around, you know, DJ LeMay or Dylan LeMay is that whether you're talking about, hey, I'm just going to make this slushy and show you guys how to do it, or here's your first day at Cold Stone, or this person has is celebrating two years of sobriety, let's celebrate together. There are thousands of people who say, I don't know what it is, but yeah. something about watching your videos, it makes me feel better. It yeah. makes me feel safe. It makes me feel like I can get through a hard time 
I'm going through a rough time right now and watching you make this red slushy is making me feel like I can do it. That is an incredible response to something that I think many people would say, what's the big deal about yeah. this kid making a slushy? Like, how is this, this, you know, amazing thing that's getting, you know, young people through the day? What is your explanation to that? Yeah, I think I think there's so many levels. And I think it's really interesting when you think about it, because if you ask each person, they're going to give you a different answer. And so I think there's, I joke with one of my friends, Malad, he's known as like the subway guys, how we got to start. And so very similar to how I did Cold Stone, he did Subway. And I always joke with him that we are so fortunate because we have this food niche. And so food is like the road to people's mm -hmm. heart. But then I always tease him and say, but ice cream is the highway. So I get to pass you. <laughs> like, but I think there's something special about like working with sweets that automatically kind of breaks this wall with people where they feel comfortable because it's already something that when they see it, it brings them back to like the satisfying feeling of eating whatever that sweet treat is. So I think I kind of get broken into their life that way. But then I think through creating a voice into people's head, it kind of like helps them become comfortable. And you build that parasocial relationship with them where they feel comfortable with you that that they know you even though they don't know you and because you're having this one-way phone conversation with them every day whereas like your videos do the same thing that's one of the ways we became friends you know is you watch these videos and you hear this person talking into your life every day and you really feel like you start to connect with them mm -hmm. and i think there's so many layers to it all where i can make a slushy and they're just like wow this is relaxing because i feel comfortable with dylan i feel like safe here because of all those other things those moments that we created and I think as short form like creators specifically, we kind of build these like mosaics where it's all these different color tiles. But when you take a step back, you see this full picture of this person. And I think that's what people really connect to is not just one video, but all of the videos together and what that really means to them. Mm -hmm. well, I can certainly attest to that personally. Yeah. I was actually, I had my videographer here. He was, we were doing a YouTube shoot a few days ago. I was like, oh yeah, my friend Dylan's coming over and I think I'm going to make this pasta for him. And I was like, oh, do you know Dylan? You may know him. He's the Cold Stone guy. He's like, wait, are you serious? I literally just binged all of his videos the other day. He's coming over. I mean, you know, he's like a guy in his late 20s and, you know, he likes bicycle riding. He doesn't eat dairy. <laughs> like, she like, like, doesn't eat dairy, but binge watched a bunch of ice cream videos by you. And again, he's like, there's something about him that I just really like. I find very, very calming. And I think a lot of people of my generation, my vintage, I'm, you know, in my mid 40s, I think they do have trouble understanding, at least at first blush, yeah. what is the magic of this guy and the ice cream cakes and now throwing ice cream, not really understanding it, but yeah. then once sitting down and maybe watching five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of your videos, all of a sudden, just like you say, you feel like, hey, I know this guy. Yeah. This guy's my friend. And I kind of want to talk to him, like yeah. just about anything. I feel like, you know, really comfortable and safe with him. Where do you think you learned, you know, whether it's from your family, your grandma, your mom, your dad, even your siblings, or perhaps a teacher, the value of safety and feeling comfortable with another person? Yeah, I think, I think again, I think it's one of those things that it kind of like happened at a younger age and that muscle just kind of grew over time where I think I enjoyed when people would come to me about stuff and I would enjoy the process of like helping them and talking with them. And so I think naturally I kind of cultivated those different skills and because I, I enjoyed it. And throughout growing up, as these situations kind of grew, I gained more experience and kind of just got more comfortable with it. And it's just strange to me because I didn't realize it was really happening. I think it naturally just kind of like grew out of my character somehow. But I think like being in a loving like household and having a very good like core, even though it was very chaotic, like me and my, family, my, my siblings fought a ton and it was just wild. But I think at the end of the day, like we knew that we had each other's backs. And I think like, like even in those circumstances, like they would come to me for things. But yeah, I think something along that way, somehow it just grew and I practiced it and people continued to come. It was crazy. And then now, like, like I said, it grew into this, which I didn't imagine because like I'm using my degree almost every day or like, you know, of not only to myself, but like continue to practice this through videos and conversations with people. It's crazy. It's not every day that a store manager of Coldstone becomes a TikTok star. 
And it's an even rarer day that said TikTok star opens his own brick and mortar ice cream shop. But that is precisely what Dylan LeMay does. When did you realize that you wanted to open up your own ice cream store? Yeah. So towards the end of college, I started to realize like, I don't know what I want to do, but I just like love this ice cream thing. I love this experience that like people get to have and my relationship with them. And but I was like, just felt strange about it. But so then when I graduated, I was given an opportunity to become the manager at the cold zone I was working at. And I was like, you know what, I need more time to figure out like this whole like big kid job thing. So I'm going to stay here. So of course, I'd like love to work here longer. So I kept working there. And in that time, I just felt a lot of pressure to find, figure out like what this career was going to look like, like what I should be doing. And all of my friends tease me. They're like, we're going to come back in five years. You're still going to be working at Cold Stone. And so like, it was just all this pressure from all these different places to do something else, but I didn't want to. So eventually like a mentor of mine, I looked up to, he, I talked to him about it all. Cause I was like, just overwhelmed. And it had been two years since I had been out of school. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I feel like I'm failing. And he was like, you know, it's okay. Like, to pursue ice cream if that's what you like doing you know you don't have to do something else because everyone is like putting pressure on you and I was like yeah like I know that but hearing it from you like it just hit different and so then he's like yeah like let's make some plans like you can talk to some people and so I talked to the the franchisees that I worked for at Cold Stone and they're like yeah we can totally make a plan of stuff we can help you like really grow into this and do more and then a few months later they're like we actually want to sell one of our franchises would you like to buy it I was like wait what oh my God. yeah and I was like i do not have anywhere near the amount of money. Like you pay me, you know how much I make. I don't have the money to do this. It was like $500,000, I think more than that. And I was like, yeah, I can't buy that from you. And then a little bit later is when like the video started taking off. And then I knew that, okay, I can actually do ice cream forever now. Like, cause I can work for myself. And like now all the people that were making fun of me, now they respect me and they think that like I am making a career out of something. And I'm literally doing the same job I did when I was 15. So I'm just making videos about it. So it was really like encouraging. But I think at a young age, my family, we baked a lot. And so we always joked about, oh, like we're going to have a family bakery someday. And then when I started working with ice cream, it kind of shifted to like, oh, maybe it's ice cream. And so I thought that my biggest dream could be opening a franchise of Cold Stone. I thought it's as big as I could dream. But then once the videos came along, I realized that it could be bigger than that and that I could open my own shop. So at that point, it was just, okay, well, what point do I do it? where I could do it to the extent I would like to. And so a lot of that was just a waiting game until that came along, until I found the right people. Wow. And when did you open your ice cream shop? July 29th of 2022. Wow. Okay. And it's called Ketchin and it's located in NoHo, right? Yeah, in New York City. Yeah. So tell us all why this particular ice cream shop by Dylan LeMay is yep. different than virtually any other ice cream shop that I've ever been to. <laughs> yeah. So... One thing that's fun is that I've been a digital content creator for a little over two years now, and then I've also worked at Ice Cream for almost 11 years now. So I try to take all of that experience together and just mash it into one big old thing. And one thing I did like all of 2021 is I traveled around, I supported a bunch of small businesses by creating like content at these small business ice cream shops. So I learned a ton from them, created great relationships with them, and I just try to like mash all this together. And so what we do different there is similar to, say, Baskin Robbins or the other ice cream places that you talked about before is we have these flavors that are preset. So say you come in and you want cookie dough, your cookie dough is all together other than opposite to what I said about Cold Stone earlier. But what we do is we make all of our ice cream in the shape of a ball. And so we have these ice cream balls, what they are. So your cookie dough ice cream would be that vanilla ice cream ball in the center Then we take edible like cookie dough, we flatten it down, and we wrap your whole ball of ice cream in it. It's already pre-ready. It's like that in a in a case. And then what you do is you come up, you say you want cookie dough. We'll take it out and we'll throw up your ice cream, do some tricks. Imagine if you've ever been to like hibachi. Yeah, I was just saying, like yeah, yeah, teppanyaki, yeah. yeah. Some like flair bartending or something. And so we'll do a bunch of tricks. It's like fun. But what we do is we'll even throw the ice cream to you. You can catch your own ice cream. That's what we're called, catch an ice cream. And then if you drop it, it's okay. It's on us. Don't worry. (laughs) We'll we'll let you try again. But then we'll have it, throw it back to us. We'll do some tricks. We'll have fun. We smash it down and we mix all those toppings that we coat your ice cream in into the inside. And we throw it back up into a cup and then we'll give it to you or into a waffle. But it's really just an engaging process. What we wanted it to be different is that we want it to be very social and a communal experience. And so instead of you coming in and just pointing and somebody dipping down into a cabinet and disappearing and then coming back with a scoop and just handing it to you, it's not very social. 
which is my favorite part about serving ice cream is that community aspect of it. So I wanted to take all of the things that would get in the way of me of serving a customer mm-hmm. and having fun with them at my previous job and just really amplify all the other things. And so when I throw ice cream to somebody, not only am I involving them, but now the whole crowd in line is cheering them on and clapping and recording. And it just adds a whole another layer of fun to it. And then not only are the employees having fun, but now they no longer have to scoop the ice cream so it doesn't break their wrists anymore. But then they also get to like throw it around, have fun with each other, and then have fun with the customer. It just creates a much more lively experience at an ice cream shop. Mm-hmm. So it sounds a little bit like you created that TikTok environment or that YouTube environment inside of your ice cream shop. It's like the people standing in line, there are the people who are commenting and the person who you're throwing the ice cream at is the one that's asked you, hey, I'm celebrating my two years of sobriety. Yes. Yeah. No, exactly. That was like the goal is to take everything and just put it together. Oh, that's amazing. And I have to say, I love the ice cream shop so much. There is a vegan flavor, y'all, because I know a lot of you are vegan. There is a dairy-free option. It's absolutely delicious. It's covered in dark chocolate and frozen strawberries, yeah, and it's amazing. Yes, freeze-dried strawberries. It's really, really good. As Dylan said earlier, being a good storyteller requires you to be a good listener. It turns out that all that listening has allowed Dylan to speak multiple different languages. No, he's not a polyglot. As far as I know, he only speaks English. I'm talking about all the different ways a person can say something a little bit cheesy, but still important. One of the things that I remember, because I was there at the opening of the ice cream shop, was that you looked frazzled. Your mom and your dad had both carrying huge boxes <laughs> up and down the stairs. And I just felt like, oh, my God, these poor people are working so hard. And there's like people everywhere. What was it like that day opening up the store, seeing your dream, your ice cream cream dream, like literally materialize with your parents there? Yeah. Well, like to give some context to the frazzled part, for some odd reason, I made a series of poor decisions <laughs> leading up to it. So we had been – the shop had finally – like construction was pretty much done and we could begin like the process of like, getting it ready for open. And we were already like way delayed. Like we were – this we opened at the end of July. We wanted to be open at the beginning of summer. So we were like way behind. Well, so we were doing 10 – to 12 to sometimes 16 hour days we didn't have air conditioning yet and all of the machines that we would turn on create like heat and this was during the heat wave in new york as well and so it was anywhere from like 90 to almost like 100 degrees in there and we're working 10 to like 16 hour days so we're just sweating we're just a mess we did that for like 15 days straight took like one day off and then we did it again for like another like 15 days and then we had these opening parties back to back to back to back. And then yours is the last one <laughs> of our opening party. And then we actually had grand opening the next day. And so it was just like one thing after another after another. And all throughout that, everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And so it's really just like all of my friends are here. I'm just going to have fun for this few hours. Once they leave, I'm going to work the rest of the night and just make things work. <laughs> so it was just crazy. But yeah, I was so thankful that my parents came and they just like suited up and they're ready to go. My mom's like training people how to make waffles and she's never even used this waffle iron before, but, and they haven't either, but she's just pretending and teaching them. And they still talk about it to this day of like, I make the best waffles because your mom taught me and it's like the cutest thing, but super thankful for them. Yeah. One of my favorite stories, and I can't remember if you told me the story or I saw one of your videos and you talked about the story. We haven't even talked about this, but you have these beautiful vlogs that are just so, so wonderful, which I wish you would take up more of, but it could have been there. But you talked about how your dad would fold your laundry for you all the time and just like kind of leave it there for you. And I could not stop thinking about that as I saw him kind of scrambling around, you know, it's just that there's this instinct by your parents to, all right, like, Shit's hitting the fan. We got to be here for Dylan. And how important was that, even just growing up, knowing that there was a dad who would fold your laundry for you when things got a little bit too tough or a mom who would, you know, be a protector for you. How much of that kind of seeped into, again, this value of creating a safe space for people? Yeah, I think it's so crazy. Like once again, like you don't realize like how blessed you are in different ways until like you really like, grow up. And I think one of my biggest blessings is my parents. And like, of course, like 
as you grow up, you realize like, oh, wow, they're human beings too. Like they have problems, but you start to realize like how they function, how they work. And I've grown to realize that my parents' biggest way to show love is through actions. And so that's how they really like show their love to you is my parents are going to show up on opening day and they're going to work their butts off harder than any employee I could ever pay. And that's because that's what they do. And that's how they show their love to like their kids and their family and like their friends and they'll do it every time. And so it's just been like so important just growing up and like seeing that work ethic and just knowing that, but then also like learning from it and the negative ways too of like, like you need to take care of yourself sometimes. And then also like, sometimes actions don't always just work for everyone. And so finding out different ways for different people of like, okay, like I would love to work super hard for them, but they might not receive this as love. So like, let me figure out another way to help this person because that's best for them, even Mm. though I prefer to love them in this way. But no, it's been like super important. I'm so thankful for my parents and like the ability to like experience that from them. And also for like the impact it's had, even just like on you and like all these other people that got to see them work like that. It's truly like beautiful. And I love my parents for that. One of the things that I think you talked about is, you know, earlier we talked about how you really did a deep dive in your comments. Do you still read all the comments? I try to. I don't do it as much as I used to, but I try to as much as I can. I mean, you're getting like tens of thousands of comments on a daily basis. It's hard, especially with like multiple platforms. Like, yeah, I try to. Yeah. One of the things that occurred to me when I was doing the same thing earlier on with my TikToks and some of my other platforms is really reading through all of the comments is it taught me similar to what you described, how very blessed I've been Mm -hmm. and how in many ways my childhood created a great deal of safety and what a privilege that has been for me and how that has shown up at various points throughout my life and even into adulthood. And really the reason for that is because in many of these comments, I see so many people who had a completely unsafe childhood, who did not have any shape of love, whether it's through service, through action, or through verbalizing, whatever, they just didn't have that. How much of you kind of digging into your community has revealed that to you, that there is a lot of pain out there, there is a lot of heartache out there. And when you do see that, do you feel pressure to address that in some way? Yeah, I think 100%. I think that's something that I'm sure you also have so many stories you can share as being those people where you want to just help people and you just want to even just give them a hug, you know, like as much as you can do. And when people feel comfortable with you and they come to you with these like deep stories and you just start to realize that like, I just can't help everyone. And it's it's so difficult when those things happen. And somebody might DM you of this story and you try to help them. And you realize that like, even if I could... Like the like if I, even if I flew all the way to you, like there's only so much that you can do for these people. And so really, it's kind of just taking a step back and realizing that sometimes like the best thing that you can do is just continue to to be that person for them. So that's creating content and that escape for them. Whereas if you're trying to have a conversation, go back and forth, like you can't truly help them. But something that you're doing is helping them co- be comfortable. And you also you have to also care for yourself where we're people as well. And we're really not meant to be able to carry so many burdens and have ourselves really be open to millions and millions of people. We're really designed to be with a small core group of people. And somehow now through the internet, we have access to millions of people. And so even though your heart may want you to care for all these other people, that it'll just be overwhelming and you won't really be able to help anyone. And it'll end up just kind of ripping you apart inside. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt ripped apart inside? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are kids that will come to you with like deep, dark stories and you're just like, oh, I just wish I could just do anything possible to help. But you just like at the end of the day, it's just so difficult to be able to do that. What do you do when you feel that way? Like, who do you go to or do you just eat your own ice cream? (laughs) I mean, I think I think one thing that's been so helpful is people like you, you know, like we Mm -hmm. all just like kind of like lean on each other in those moments of like, hey, this thing is happening. And like, it's hard to talk to most other people, because they don't they don't get it. They don't get that pressure. Like they can relate in some type of ways. But I think leaning on other people in similar circumstances, because we can all kind of bond over it in a way. Before we conclude our chat, because of his degree in counseling and a clearly developed sense of empathy, I thought it might be fun to get Dylan's thoughts on an Ask Joanne. All right. So since you're basically a professional counselor, <laughs> really 
excited to actually do one of the Ask Joanne's. Um, as many of you know, I invite all my listeners and newsletter subscribers to submit questions about life, career, love, eating, whatever. Uh, last, you know, we've tackled all sorts of questions about food and love and things like that. So this week, I'm going to invite Dylan to weigh in on one of the questions. Okay, so this week, Renee asks, my question is, do you think the pandemic played any part in your decision to become full-time content creator? I feel like a lot of us collectively sat back and really reevaluated things. It gave us more time to think, to reflect, to appreciate. You were instrumental in helping me through the toughest time, and for that, I want to thank you. So I turn that question to you. I mean, I'd love to hear what your answer is. Do you think that the pandemic and everything wrapped up in that, you know, the time that you had, maybe, you know, the store was kind of a little bit slower because nobody was going out to eat ice cream and maybe there was some pressure and a little bit of angst. I mean, how much of that played a role in the Dylan LeMay we now know today? I mean, basically a business mogul and one of the most successful content creators on the planet. Yeah, I definitely think it played a huge role. I think not only was I in a dark place, but so many other people were too. And we were really like seeking connection in any way. And then the platform was really blowing up because everyone had time on their hands and they're like, what do we what do we do with our time? And so with TikTok being fresh and new, a lot of people jumped to TikTok to find that. And I think we did as well. Some people did it just consume content, but we did it to, to watch it. But I think that rawness that was just everything was so abrasive in life. And we were all just like so beat up and bruised. And we were just looking for people to connect. And so throughout all the crazy videos that were on there, if you found a heartfelt person, um, then you would really connect with them. And I, I think that's one thing that I mean, I would relate with Renee in that way of like, that's how I found your videos. And that's how I connect with you. And I think that throughout that time, like you helped me so much. And so I would say like, it's, it played a huge role, I think, in everything and us just all connecting to one another. And everyone took those times to really do a lot of thinking, <laughs> for sure, and soul searching and figure out what is the things that we really want in life and what kind of changes can we really make because so many things were taken from us in that time. But yeah, I think it played a huge role. I think none of us would really be talking right now or hearing this if it wasn't for the lockdowns and things like that. I completely agree. I love what you said. So many things were taken from us. And I think that for a lot of us, we reacted in all different kinds of ways, you know, from having those things taken from us. Most fundamentally, our safety was taken from us because every day we're thinking, like, I might lose my job. I might lose, you know, my finances. You, the economy is tanking. And oh, by the way, people are dying. Yeah. We're losing our loved ones. We're losing our health. We're losing our ability to walk out the door and feel safe and comfortable. We've got to wear these masks and all of these things are changing every single day. For me, I went into complete panic mode. And I think there are some people who did. Other people kind of sat back in their haunches and was like, all right, let me just think about this. Let me figure it out. And everybody kind of reacts differently to yeah. these kinds of pressures. But ultimately, the soul searching that you reference, as well as the immense amount of thinking that was going on, whether it was in a panicked state or whether it was in a more calm state, I do think that what it forced us to do was to find a way to fill the void that remained after the things were taken from us. Mm -hmm. And we did that either by consuming other people's content or creating content. But the idea of it was to develop a community, yeah. right? Because that's what was taken from us most. 100%. You know, like we yeah. couldn't be with our families. We couldn't see our friends. We couldn't see our colleagues, right? And so we were just kind of grappling with that and figuring out, well, how do I recreate that sort of, you know, uh, resonance that I had with the people online, I guess, because that's all we had, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we think about answering the question, are you ready? It can come up in all sorts of contexts. Are you ready to make your first TikTok? Are you ready to open your first ice cream shop? And in Dylan's case, it can be, are you ready to throw some ice cream? In all cases, believe it or not, it takes small or even big amounts of courage to press forward. We end this chat with Dylan by discussing the role of courage in his story. And amazingly, 
what he's discovered about where courage will lead him just over the course of our conversation. So one of the things that I I did do a little bit of internet stalking of you, and I saw this great quote that you gave in an interview, and you said, the biggest thing it takes to toss and catch ice cream is courage. Mm. And I love that. So I think as you described earlier, one of the cool things about catching ice cream is that you will literally throw the ice cream at the customer if that's what they want. And you say... And I think, again, I'm going to quote you again, the biggest thing it takes to toss and catch ice cream is courage. So you're the one tossing the ice cream. What kind of courage does it take to do that? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny when you think about it, like you boil it back. It's like we're throwing food, like we're playing with food. Those are like two things you're told your whole life like not to do. And so really it's like breaking through like this wall that people have drilled into your head of like, don't play with your food, like get your hands off your food kind of a thing. And so once you kind of break through that, then like now to yourself, you're like, wait, I can throw this. And so then it's like building up that courage to like actually throw it. Like majority of people, when they try to throw ice cream the first time, it goes nowhere because they don't want to put any force into it because they're so afraid to like hurt the ice cream. But like once you finally get past that, it's like this like rewarding feeling. I know it sounds so silly. You guys are like, he's talking about throwing ice cream in the air. But like, really though, you like kind of break through those things and you catch it and you're like so proud of yourself. Like, wow, I did this thing. I didn't think I could do it. And for me, being someone that can barely throw stuff in the trash, like throwing ice cream and somehow building a whole brand around throwing and catching ice cream, it's kind of like a big deal for me. It took me like a long time to even be coordinated enough to like actually do this. But then to see like how simple it really is once you break down and build up that courage and just helping other people experience that as well. I love when someone comes in, they're like, I'll never be able to do this. I'm like, oh, trust me, you will. Like if I could do it, you're going to do it. I promise you'll be able to do it. And then getting them to get that experience of like, wow, I did it. Yeah. Well, do you think that it took courage for you to not listen to everyone telling you to do whatever it was in college? Hey, stick with the normal, you know, career path, get a normal everyday job instead of doing this ridiculous ice cream thing. I mean, there had to have been some level of courage that it took to do that. Oh, yeah. 100%. Tons of courage. Yeah. But it was like something inside of me, like in my heart, like I just knew, like, but this is like my thing. Like, this is what I enjoy doing. Like, why would I want to force myself to do something else and just like be unhappy? And so really, when I got that courage to get over those fears of like, what is everyone else going to think? And then that's when I really started to enjoy it. And then that's when the videos end up coming and I could really skyrocket because I had built that like courage. Mm. Why do you think it takes courage to listen to your own heart? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think just fundamentally it's like hard, especially like when you're growing up to really like kind of grow into your own. And I think that process just kind of takes courage to like break out from the norm and to do what everyone else is doing. And because like you're you're... You're taught to go to school and you listen and then you go to college and you listen and you get that job that everyone wants, you know what I'm saying? And to each time you try to break out of those normal cycles, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. Mm. Where do you think your courage is going to lead you next? Oh, that's tricky. (laughs) I think that's one thing that's been really difficult is I think it's been like this, this race so far of like, oh, wow, I'm finally excited that. I figured out like I can do this thing I like doing, which is ice cream. And then it's like, oh, the videos are doing well and I'm successful on these different platforms. And at first it was TikTok and now it's YouTube and I did those. And then now it's like, oh, I'm opening an ice cream shop and I did that. And so right now I'm kind of trying to figure out what that next thing is because it's like I've I've met these milestones and I'm kind of like in that like period where it's like, okay, wait, what am I doing now? Like, what's the next goal? Like, what am I working towards? So I'm trying to figure that out. Is there something that you know will be a part of it? Like, will it continue to help people? Will it? I know I know what it is. The big thing that I'm using courage to work on right now, I think is myself. I think you've kind of hit on it in a few of the questions that I've answered so far, but I've kind of learned like all of this time that I've really put so much effort on helping other people that I've really hurt myself a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've just been trying to figure out those things and really like grow and and learn about Dylan because it's I feel like throughout the times where I've put so much effort in helping other people I've kind of hid away from all these other things and one of the reasons why I was so successful starting to produce videos on TikTok and then onto YouTube was because I was in such a like dark period of like just dealing with all these things that I just 
hid in the videos. And so I would hide in work every day. Like I said, I'd walk through that archway and I'd leave everything in the back room and I'd go help customers and I'd focus on making all these people's days so great. And I'd walk back through the archway and I'd take all my burdens home with me and just deal with them. And the next day I'd walk through the archway and it'd make me feel so much better. And once I began to make videos, I would use the videos as an escape from that as well. I could put so much effort into it because I was hiding from these things. But now that I've grown and I'm starting to realize that like, whoa, I need to like figure out those things and work on them. Yeah. So the next big excavation is the one in the interior. Yeah. Yeah. Which is way more difficult than the exterior. Heck of a lot scarier. Yeah, yeah. A lot more <laughs> Yeah. You're going to need a lot of it. <laughs> but I think you've done an incredible job of learning so much and building this amazing community mm. that hopefully will not just give you courage, but confidence in taking as many steps necessary inward to find, you know, the next version of Dylan that needs to be there. That's amazing. Well, I think it's so beautiful what you've created for everyone who's listening. If you haven't checked out Dylan LeMay, you should. Most of you may even recognize that this is the the young man that Rich Roll <laughs> constantly talks about on his podcast. Like pretty much every three weeks, he, him and Skolnick are talking about the ice cream dude, uh, Joanne Molinaro's friend. This is Dylan LeMay. Maybe I should have led with that because I know many of you guys listen to the Rich Roll podcast. Thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Thank you everyone for listening. It's impossible for me to talk about Dylan without sharing a short story about why I personally find him to be so extraordinary. Last summer, just a few days after my dog died, I flew to New York City for one night to celebrate the grand opening of Dylan's ice cream shop. Now, Dylan had been toiling away for months to get Ketchin, the name of his ice cream shop, open by summer, from, you know, signing the lease on a storefront in NoHo, to meeting with vendors and suppliers across the country, to sourcing solid, non-dairy milks for his vegan flavors, to getting behind the counter of his very own shop to serve up ice cream in the same way he'd been doing for half his life as a store manager of Cold Stone. But instead of scooping out ice cream from buckets... Ketchin's glass display held perfect round ice cream spheres coated in chocolate and encrusted with Oreo cookies, dried strawberries, cereal, and other nostalgic goodies. After hugging me hello, Dylan invited me behind the counter, showed me how to press the heavy steel scoopers into my vegan ice cream ball until it broke, mash everything around until the ice cream grew supple and pliable before depositing it neatly into a small biodegradable cup. Even as I laughed for the cameras, dove enthusiastically into my ice-creamed creation for Dylan's sake, I carried a hot coal inside of me, one that threatened to burn a hole through my chest. The wound from my dog's death, it was still raw, quivering. But it was Dylan's day, and I wanted to be there for him. As I watched Dylan mash ice cream balls and wipe crumbs off his brand new counter, greet fans, give interviews to the press, and ramp his lanky arms around friends who came to say, hi, congratulations, all while his mom and dad quietly ensured that scoopers were cleaned and dried, supplies were tucked away in the back, everything was where it was supposed to be so that their 25-year-old son could be the star that his investors were counting on him to be, I took a spoonful of my ice cream. Let it dissolve slowly on my tongue, hoping its cool softness would reach into my toes. I thought about a quote I read from one of my favorite authors. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, You must give it to no one and nothing, not even an animal. You must carefully wrap it round with hobbies and little luxuries and routine and avoidances of entanglement and then lock it up in the casket or coffin of your own selfishness. And this means that in the long run, the alternative to tragedy, or at least to the threat of tragedy, is damnation. For in that casket, safe, still, and unventilated in the darkness, it will go bad. Not broken, 
but finally unbreakable, impenetrable, resistant to all good and joy. That's a quote from C.S. Lewis. You see, rejection, whether from your friends, your parents, your boyfriend, or the girl you meet for coffee at the vegan croissant shop, all of it hurts. But sometimes we guard ourselves not just from the sharp repudiation of rejection, but just the mess of it all. If only all our relationships could be as tidy as my color-coded sock drawer, as spotless as Dylan's new countertops. But life doesn't work that way. Oftentimes, even after the fire has been put out, we are left with cleaning up the ashes. And however scary it might be to open the doors to that wreckage, I'm not sure I want to find out what happens to me if I try and continue to do it alone. That night, after the celebration of Dylan's launch, we met up at a bar to celebrate. Dylan sauntered in, looking not so much a dashing dream chaser as a candle down to the very last centimeter of its wick. He remained quiet amid the celebration, and I instantly wished we were back in my home in Chicago, where he'd often crashed during his business trips. So many times, and would stay up into the wee hours, and he'd just listen to me, all my anxieties spilling out of me like a vial of jelly beans, about quitting my partner job, going full-time as a content creator, living the dream, as he often called it. When my book came out just a couple years ago, he showed up to the launch in New York City, and he called it my book wedding, with a smile I can't soon forget. So that night, the night of his launch, we both left the bar early together with a mutual friend of ours. On the walk back, we took a selfie together, the New York cityscape in the background, and something about that act, taking a picture to memorialize not the opening of the ice cream shop, but the joy of being with people who could translate our exhaustion, anxiety, and yes, even our grief as competently as native speakers it allowed me to lean back as much as I needed to because I knew I wouldn't fall. So I don't know about you, but I am definitely in the mood for some ice cream. Good news, Dylan has recently added another vegan flavor to the lineup at Ketchin. So if you're in New York City, make sure to check it out. My husband and I were just there a few weeks ago and man, (laughs) it is really like the best ice cream I've ever had. It's so good. Otherwise, I want to thank you all so much for joining us for another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Leave a comment and a rating below. Also, it would mean so much to me if you shared this episode or any other episode of this podcast that you have found inspiring with your friends, your families, colleagues, and even on social media. We are working so hard to grow this podcast and all of your shares are indescribably helpful. Otherwise, until next week, have a wonderful and lovely day. 